Hi everyone, it's Jen, um, pastor at The Meeting House in East Toronto. I wanted to share with you today a reading for the season of Lent. Um, before we get into the reading, let's read together from Mark chapter 8, verses 31 to 38. Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him al along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. So I've been looking for this season um, something to add to my daily devotions uh, for Lent. And uh, some of you may be aware of the pastor by the name of Brian Zond. He's a good friend of the Meeting House, and he has a Lent devotional book uh, available called The Unvarnished Jesus. And so I downloaded that onto my Kindle, and I want to share with you uh, the reading um, from the first day of Lent. So again, this is from Brian Zond's The Unvarnished Jesus. We begin our Lenten journey with Jesus by hearing him tell us that he's not headed to greatness as the world esteems greatness, but to the cross and to death. Peter and the rest of the disciples understand that Jesus is on his way to the capital city of Jerusalem to lay claim to the throne, to become the king of the Jews. But without any ambiguity, Jesus tells his disciples that he will suffer many things, be rejected by the chief priests, and finally be killed. Yes, Jesus also says that his apparent defeat will be turned to victory when he is raised on the third day, but his disciples probably hear this as an idiom referring to the resurrection of the righteous at some point in the future. As when Hosea says, after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. That Jesus could become king of the Jews through suffering and death is inconceivable to Peter. For Peter, a Messiah who was killed is a Messiah who fails. And Peter didn't sign up for failure. Jesus alone seems to understand that a breakthrough into new life is only attained through the experience of loss. Martin Luther was right. Christianity is not a theology of glory, but a theology of the cross. But to choose the way of the cross over the way of glory is a hard lesson to learn. Like Peter, we also may be inclined to argue with Jesus when he calls us to choose the way of the cross. Surely not, Jesus. I don't want to suffer and lose. I want to be great and win. But Jesus calls that kind of thinking satanic. As the book of Proverbs says, there is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. Most of us are scripted to think that life is a game and the purpose of life is to win. This is the way that seems right, but the divine truth is that life is a gift and the purpose of life is to learn to love well. And so Jesus invites us to follow him, not in a march to greatness, but into the cross-carrying way of self-denial. This and this alone is the way of true discipleship. It's also the way to abundant life. Grasping for greatness is the way of the rat race. But as Walter Brueggemann says, the problem with the rat race is that even if you win, you're still a rat. Or as Jesus put it, what do you gain if you win it all but lose your soul? During this season of Lent, let's renew our commitment to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we are so often afraid that the way of the cross leads only to loss, a loss that we fear we cannot bear. Help us to believe you and to embrace the cross as the way that ultimately leads to authentic love and abundant life. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jen. So helpful to start out our, our morning with, uh, you know, processing this season of Lent that we're in. And maybe you're joining us for the first time and you're like, what is Lent? Like, is she pronouncing Lend wrong? Like, is this a giving ask? Lent is is a, a season in the church, like the, the universal church, the church of the world, the Christian church of the world that that lengthens the, the lead up to to Easter, to Good Friday, and to Resurrection Sunday, to Hope Sunday. And so as we enter into this season, I think that's just such a wonderful reminder of like, whew, 
take a breath, lengthen, wait, prepare. Um, it reminds you what you're uh, sharing there, Jen. There's a, um, a little nugget of gold throughout the Gospels, but in this particular, um, for this particular morning where we're talking about like, how did Jesus handle power and what does he invite us into? In Matthew's Gospel, uh, Jesus has his disciples like around the table and he's talking about the his death, his suffering, which is about to come. And some of the disciples' moms come to Jesus and they're like, so it would be great if our little boys got to be at your left and right hand. Can you make sure that's possible? Because like this journey with you, Jesus, this well-known rabbi Messiah must just be always up and to the right. So can you make that happen? And Jesus rebukes them, but then actually invites them and says, you have no idea what you're asking. Like, I'm headed to suffering and to death as a means to show self-sacrifice and love. So yeah, your boys will endure, will experience this, and so will you. But take a breath, like think about what you're asking and think about what's to come. And so maybe that's just a helpful posture for us as we lean in this morning. Maybe you've like crashed into Sundays. My wife and I have uh, two girls and uh, Caitlin is 19, Ella is 14. And when they were little, I always found that uh, Sundays were great, but also were like high stress. And so you're coming off the week that was into the week that is. And sometimes you're just like crashing into Sundays and like trying to put on a happy face or to take something from the teaching or worship or whatever. I think that's just such a wonderful reminder for us, Jen. You've postured us so well to just be like, Jesus, the week that was is what it was. Help us to anticipate the day that is, this moment that we're in together, to wait, to listen, to be thankful for your presence, and to tune into uh, how you lead us away from coercive power and towards love. I love that line that uh, Jesus teaches us how to love, to live, and to love well. And so that's our prayer. It's my prayer for you and for me as we engage this morning. Welcome to the meeting house. Um, that's your sermon before the sermon. <laughs> my name is Jimmy. I'm glad to be with you again here. Um, we're going to be jumping into our uh, worship through music in just a few minutes and then taking in some great teaching again. I'll be there in the chat if you want to say hi. Excited to interact with you again. And if you're part of our, our Discord uh, fam, you can go to the meeting house.com slash discord if you're not but make sure that you're saying hi to people that have joined there and if it's your first time there you will be warmly welcomed whether there or in the youtube chat well let's continue with our experience of lengthening and waiting and preparing and engaging with our senses through worship through music let's sing together good morning everyone welcome to the meeting house we're so glad to see you that you're here, that you made it to church. Um, we invite you to stand and sing with us, and uh, we'll just spend the next few minutes uh, just focusing our attention on God and thinking about how worthy he is of all of our praise.
says you use the, the weak to lead the strong is so good. And when I think of power and how the world sees it, it looks a lot like influence and success, power, money. But what Jesus, Jesus modeled was humility. Washing the feet of his friends, showing people that it's about love and giving. Giving of ourselves, setting aside the things that might elevate us above anybody. To follow Jesus is to rid us of ourselves and make space for the spirit. For there to be less of us and more of Jesus. His power looks like dying on the cross. Intentionally laying down the things that the world tells us to care about. So that we can serve others and humble ourselves, be humbled in the process. A line in this next song says, everything I once held dear, I count it all as loss. Lead me to the cross. To lay down our pride and our ego, our power, our influence, our success and pick up our cross to walk alongside Jesus. How he modeled what matters and what we should care about. And it looks a lot different than what society says. Second Corinthians 12, nine says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. So here I am boasting about my weakness to say that there are a lot of things that I need help with that I don't do very well. So with this next song, let's shine the light on our weaknesses and ask God to help us make our way to the cross, to invite him in to our weakness so that his power can be made strong and we can see and feel his strength. For my ransom And everything I once held dear I count it all as lost Lead me to the cross Where your love poured out Bring me to my knees Lord, I lay me down And break me of my
Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet. Justice and power must be brought together, so that whatever is just may be powerful. 
and whatever is powerful may be just. Blaise Pascal Yet as I read through the birth stories about Jesus, I cannot help but conclude that though the world may be tilted towards the rich and powerful, God is tilted toward the underdog. Philip Yancey Only in the cross of Christ will we receive power when we are powerless. We will find strength when we are weak. We will experience hope when our situation is hopeless. Only in the cross is there peace for our troubled hearts. Michael Yusuf Many Christians estimate difficulty in the light of their own resources, and thus they attempt very little and they always fail. All giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on his power and his presence to be with them. Hudson Taylor My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Jesus. Good morning. Whether you're here in person or online or at one of our locations, great to be together again. I know, four weeks in a row. <laughs> We're almost done. But it is good to be together. And we've been busy, haven't we? We've been taking inventory in this We Are Here series of things that we feel like God is saying to us that are pretty important as a church here at base camp setting up in between legs of our journey. We've been huddled around the fire doing a lot, haven't we? We've had a lot of practices together. We reminded ourselves of what our purpose is, knowing and becoming more like Jesus. This is not just a spatial or a temporal journey we're on. It's one of transformation. We practiced celebrating, reminding who God is, fixing our eyes on that destination. We practiced lament and confession and repentance, realizing that sometimes we get off track and we need to reset ourselves towards Jesus. We scanned the environment from a macro perspective, from a micro perspective, and we talked about equipping ourselves with a paradigm, a Jesus-centered, centered set way of navigating the next leg of our journey together. And last week, we spent some time on reconciliation, recognizing that relationships get impacted along the way on an extreme journey, and we need to pay attention and constantly be reconciling and renewing our relationships with God and one another. And hopefully it's clear, but it's worth mentioning, these are not just one-and-done practices, are they? We don't just leave base camp and stop doing these things. They're tools that we're constantly going back to as followers of Jesus, as those exploring his way together on a daily and a weekly and a monthly and a yearly basis as a church community. And we're going to continue that today, and today's might feel a little bit different. Extreme adventurers are good at looking ahead and saying, what are the obstacles that are going to be on our path? Not because we are afraid of them, but because we need to be equipped to understand them and to navigate them well together. And we really sense that God's been saying to us as a church that one of those obstacles is the powers that play around us and the way that we use power as a church. And we need to develop and maintain and sustain and lead into a Jesus-centered way of understanding and using power inside of our community for the next leg of our journey. And I'm privileged and honored to have the responsibility of helping put words to some things that we sense God has been saying to us as a broader community. As we've listened over recent months, this is one of the themes along with others that we've been talking about that has risen to the surface that we collectively as a body care about. And I enter into this conversation very self-aware of my own identity and how it affords me power and privilege through my gender, through my race, through my education, through my sexual orientation, whatever the case may be. And I take that really seriously, and I want to say that, that I enter this conversation as a fellow student, a fellow disciple of the way of Jesus. And it's not only better, but necessary for us to have these conversations together as a body, isn't it? Especially these topics can't just be about a paid professional holy person dispensing answers. We need to submit to the way of Jesus, root our understanding of something like power in Scripture and in how it points us to Christ. And that's what we're going to do together today. So I'd invite you on that journey along with me. I know for me, and I think for many of us, it can be really tempting in a conversation like this to immediately jump to 
the human manifestations of what power looks like in our world. Issues that really matter and are important, like justice and poverty, etc. But sometimes if we race too fast to humanize these issues, we miss the bigger reality of the spiritual realm that's at play. And we reduce Christianity to just a commentary on the weakness of the secular system. We have a lot more to offer than that. We have transformation towards Jesus as an offer for one another and for those looking in. So we want to start with an understanding of what are these powers that are at play? What are we really talking about here? Scripture paints a very interesting picture of power at play. Throughout Scripture and throughout the words of Jesus, we see this dual reality of both the spiritual realm and the way that realm manifests in an earthly way. We see the picture of power at play on a macro basis, but also within and inside of us on a micro basis. Ephesians 6.12 says this, For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. You can see that interplay woven throughout that verse, and that's true throughout Scripture. The both end of the spiritual realm and the way it manifests on the front lines of humanity. And Romans 7.23 says this, But there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. This is our friend Paul talking once again. If we reduce power to just something happening spiritually or just manifesting in a systemic way at large in society, we can forget about and ignore and downplay our agency as human beings that Christ has given us and our role in bringing and advancing the kingdom of God here on earth. And if we reduce power, on the other hand, to just something material and just something that's happening here in the physical realm, we lose sight of the bigger cosmic picture and reality around us, that Christ has defeated these powers and that there is a spiritual realm happening around us. Hey, if we're here to follow Jesus or learn what Jesus is about, we acknowledge that there's something happening spiritually. So that realm is real. And here's where being Jesus-centered makes all the difference. Colossians 1 reminds us that Everything was created in and through and by and for Jesus, and he has dominion over all. Things in this world and things in the unseen world. And later in Colossians 2, I think we've got this one here, we're reminded that Jesus has disarmed the powers and authorities, and he made a public spectacle of them, triumph triumphing them over them, if I could read, by the cross. So what's with the theology lesson here? There's a big point at the start of our conversation about power. The cosmos belongs to Jesus. Everything that was ever created was created in and through him. He owns the powers. And he's defeated and disarmed them on the cross. We've been liber liberated from the powers of the world around us and the, and the dark spiritual realm. Christ has won that battle. This changes the way that we live, it means that we're not entering the world every day with our back against the wall, threatened and afraid, feeling like we need to change the world and push back and create a new reality. No, it means that the scale has have fallen off of our eyes and we can see reality for how it actually is. That we have already been liberated from these powers. And we have the gift of sharing that liberation with those around us who have not yet seen it. That's a fundamentally different paradigm with which to enter the world every morning. And these powers manifest around us in different ways, don't they? Jesus was tempted by this power over way of the world by Satan himself. You can read about that in Luke chapter 4. He was tempted by powers that manifest in material and economic power, in political power, and in military power, and in religious power. Some things never change, do they? 2,000 years later, those systems are alive and well in the world around us. We need not be afraid, but we need to be aware, just like Jesus was.
So you may have noticed a pattern over the past few weeks. We're going to study what Jesus tells us about the way to live. And we're going to do that through Scripture. So if you have a Bible with you, I'd invite you to open it up, or you can open up a Bible app, or check out this Scripture when you get home. Some of our locations have Bibles, and we can get you one if you'd like. We're going to open it up back to the book of Philippians again. Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to read from 5 to 10 together. And I'd encourage us to see the way Jesus uses power in this scripture. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father." So here's Jesus, with every right and ability to use power over people. And what does he do? He descends as low as possible and empties himself of his privileges, of his rights, into a posture of servanthood and obedience to God. A posture of power under. And he doesn't pretend as though he has none. In fact, in the verse right after he's tempted by Satan in Luke 4, we're reminded he's filled with the Spirit's power. And we see that again here. As he descends low, God lifts him up. In Christ's weakness, he himself is even filled with God's power. He's establishing a way of using power for us that is completely opposite to the way of the world. And unless we, th- lest we think that this is just Jesus telling us or Paul telling us how Jesus lives, there's that verse 5. It says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. So this involves us too, everybody. This is the model for how we are to live. A model of power under servanthood that not only tolerates our weakness, but embraces it in the crazy upside down or maybe right side up kingdom of God way. So this is not how the world uses power, is it? Matthew 20, in Jesus' own words, reminds us how the the world uses power. You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we need to ask ourselves important questions as a church, as the broader church, about how sometimes we can be complicit in using power the way the world uses power. We need to pay attention to the temptation for churches to really look more like empires than models of suffering and sacrifice and power under servanthood. See, if we're co-opted and tempted by the same powers that tempted Jesus, material and economic growth, political control, even religious power, then it makes sense that we'll organize ourselves around achieving goals like growth and self-preservation. But if we adopt the posture of Jesus and we reestablish our purpose as transforming to know and become more like him, then all of a sudden, the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized, they're not people that are just weighing on our goals of growing and sustaining and getting more power. We're sharing our liberation with one another from those powers and inviting people into a kingdom that embraces everybody for their value and where everybody's got a role to play in this body together. 
and where we're sharing power with one another. It fundamentally changes the way we exist as a church when we adopt Jesus' posture of power under. And this is why we care about issues like justice and issues like poverty. It's why we're willing to do the hard work of pressing into conversations around diversity and what it means for certain people groups to be marginalized. Not because we're trying to be politically correct and to score points, because we believe that that's what it means to use our power under in service to one another in creating a church where everyone's honored as part of the body of Christ and where the full diversity of his body is on display in all of its beauty. No slave, no free, no Jew or Gentile in Christ's kingdom. Amen. And we really believe that this is at the root of a lot of dynamics within our church and a church like ours in very practical and very real ways. It impacts the way that we interact with macro-systemic issues like justice and poverty. But it also in, impacts the way that we form and shape very specific things that are happening within our church community as well. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the idea of concept cars. I love concept cars. I've always loved concept cars. If you're not familiar with concept cars and you're wondering what I'm talking about, I'll explain. Sometimes car manufacturers like to create these weird futuristic looking models or prototypes of a car, not because they'll necessarily end up rolling off the production line one day, but they challenge us into putting flesh and bones or metal and plastic, as it were, onto ideas and making them real enough to interact with and stretch our mind towards what could be possible. I've always thought that's a great way to think about certain aspects of life. What does our concept car look like as we forge into the future? We've got an image of a few of them up there. I don't even know where you're supposed to sit in that thing. I think that one was actually created for the latest Avatar movie, for all of you movie buffs. But see, they, they stretch our imagination, but they go through at least enough effort to make it real enough to have to think through some of what it could look like to put these ideas in motion. I'd invite you to just dream with me for a minute about some concept cars for our church. What, is, what are the possibilities for a church like ours as we think about how we interact with and engage with power? I see a concept car around the issue of empowerment. What it means to be a church that's distributing and directing power outwards. Not trying to be a center of gravity that is bringing it inside to hold up the institution or in the hands of a few people. But where the direction of energy is outward, where the power is in the hands of our local communities that are sent to disciple one another, to bring the good news into our neighborhoods. Where the diverse giftings within our body are activated. Where we actually have tools and ways of understanding how each of us have been gifted and how that can contribute to the way that we get involved and serve the church and where power isn't concentrated just in the hands of a certain type of gift or a certain one or two particular gift sets but that we activate and embrace the diversity of giftings across the body and where as leadership we take seriously how a Jesus-centered power under way of serving impacts the way we structure leadership, the roles of leader in a, leaders in a church. We learn in Ephesians 4 that what is the role of the church to equip the body to do the good works? That's a fundamentally different way of looking at what leadership is, even in a church community like ours. I think of a concept car around the way that we listen and discern as a church. We use language like community hermeneutic at the meeting house, which is just a fancy way to say the way that we interpret our reality, the way that we listen to God together is in community and we give voice to one another as we make decisions and discern our direction as a church. 
That requires a power under listening, serving, sacrificing way of being as a church. And I think about diversity. I think about the reasons why it's important for us to be accountable to investing in women, to be investing in racial inclusion and diversity within our community, and many other axes of diversity. Again, not just because we want to be politically correct, but because we believe that that's what it means to take a power under posture. And that means those of us who have power and influence need to get in the game and be involved and adopt that posture of servanthood and power under. Because we want the fullness of the body of Christ to be represented in our midst, don't we? Amen. And so often, the message we explicitly or implicitly send to marginalized people groups is, bootstrap your way there, you go try and get more power and we'll see you at the finish line. But that's not the way of Jesus. We're called to lay it down and to serve one another with the power under posture. So we're still learning all these things. We're not starting from zero, but we're still learning. And we need a posture of humility and submission to Jesus and his power within us, made possible by us emptying ourselves, embracing our weakness so that we can invite his power in in order to move in this direction together. But it is a hopeful direction for us. And I want to invite you on that journey. So we're going to leave today's teaching with a question. Wherever you're at on the spectrum in a conversation like this, this requires all of us leaning in together. So I want to ask us this question. What would taking a power under posture of servanthood look like for you in your meeting house community where you are? What would taking a power under posture of servanthood look like for you in your meeting house community where you are? Maybe we can reflect on that individually. We can reflect on that in our home churches, in our discipleship relationships, and we can reflect on that as larger communities together. Let's pray. Jesus, we... Thank you that though you are the God of all power and might, you don't lord it over us. You chose to enter into our condition and empty yourself and place yourself in a posture of servanthood, using your power to love us, to show us your mercy and your grace, and to offer the gift of liberation and freedom to every one of us. Thank you, Jesus. Will you help us this week, Jesus, today, this moment, this week, this month, this year, in all aspects of our life, to understand and embrace what it means to do the same, to take a power under posture of servanthood to one another, receiving your love and sharing it with one another as we advance your kingdom here on earth. We pray this in your name. Amen. And you are 
sing that part again. Let your name be lifted higher. Jesus, enter in on our praise as we lift your name. we praise you with everything we are. Thank you that you cover our brokenness. Thank you that you know us so deeply and intimately and you still love us despite our weakness. 
in spite of our weakness, God. That's where we see your strength. That's where we feel you. That's where we experience you. That's where we learn to depend on you, knowing that we can't do it ourselves. We need you. We need you, God. And we need each other. Help us to be reminded that we need you and we need each other. And that the whole point is relationship. The whole point is not to be perfect, but to just be a better version of ourselves every day for there to be less of us and more of you as we rid ourselves, spirit, so that you can fill us. Thank you, God, that that is your gift to us. Amen, indeed. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Discord chat. Thank you, live chat. I've just been learning so much of just like tracking with our conversation about like our concept cars and the aspirational servant posture that is love that will lead our church forward. Um, so yeah, it's just, I'm it, yeah thankful to be with you all uh, this morning. I'll mention a couple things before we send you uh, on your way, whatever this day looks like and this week looks like for you. Number one, uh, we can't do this without each other, and that includes our, our money and our finances. And so for those of you who joyfully and generously give week over week, we don't take that for granted. Thank you so much. Uh, without you, none of this would be possible. And for those of you that are still kicking tires around, maybe like, what does it mean to give to a church? What does it mean to give to our church? All the information is right there. You can go to themeetinghouse.com slash give and uh, touch base if you have any questions about what that looks like. I'll also mention Home Church. Again, if you're checking us out for the first, second, third time and you've heard Home Church, but you're like, what is that? It's just a, a chance for us as disciples, followers of Jesus to turn monologue into dialogue, to dialogue together uh, what we're learning, what we're questioning what we're processing and then for us to walk it out together in real relationship and community whether in person or online so we hope that you will take part join or continue to be a part of uh, a home church near you well brothers and sisters grace and peace to you as you go about the rest of your day and like rachel said in uh, the chat there i'm excited to hear and see all of our concept cars leading into the future much love to you grace and peace enjoy your sunday